Malta, to most of the men in my group, was just a romantic name. None of us ever dreamed that this completely isolated rock would become the thickest thorn in our side. Robert Kovalevsky was a Luftwaffe bomber commander during World War II and participated in raids against the island of Malta. Today, he operates a foundry in Witten, Germany. Douglas Alfred Adcock served aboard a British cruiser during the siege of Malta. Today, a civil servant, he lives in Leicester, England. The truth of the matter is that I was bored with my job on the post office, so I joined the Royal Marines. The uniform attracted me. I didn't anticipate getting caught up in the mess on Malta, but I did. In the struggle for Malta, the lives of Douglas Adcock and Robert Kovalevsky came together for a brief moment. Two fighting men, one Englishman, one German, relive that moment in history. To Benito Mussolini, the British position at Malta is untenable. The island outpost is over a thousand miles from the nearest British bases at Gibraltar in the west and Alexandria in the east. Still, it is only 20 minutes by air from Italian Sicily. Whoever controls Malta is traffic cop of the Mediterranean. In 1940, that policeman wears a British uniform. On June 11, one day after Italy enters the war, Mussolini makes his move. People take to the old historic caves and catacombs. These shelters have been enlarged so that every civilian on Malta can go underground. The Maltese have a tradition of withstanding siege. The Italians raid the island colony eight times the first day and 30 more times in the first week. No medals are won for bombing accuracy. Operating from Walter is HMS Penelope, a light cruiser. Aboard on a gun crew is Royal Marine Douglas Alfred Adcock. We put back into port and go and leave. Food supplies are still good, and one can still enjoy Maltese hospitality at the restaurants. The only noticeable change is the dear prices of food and the dearer prices of drinks. My first reactions to the bombings are average, I suppose. There's quite a bit of rubble about, but no real damage. The Maltese people themselves, however, appear somewhat jittery. Everyone waiting for the sirens to start up and then dash off for the shelters. Or at least, so it seems to me. The Italians have been at us quite spasmodically from rather high levels. They seldom come into range and it's a bit of a laugh. Nobody worries much over it, but they have forced us to abandon our leisurely ways. Six months of bombing, the British naval and military installations remain intact. Submarines and seaplanes emerge from Malta and torpedo access supply vessels en route to Africa. The 
Mediterranean that the fascists have sometimes called our sea is still anybody's lake. January 1941, an entire German air fleet, Luftlade II, is yanked from the Russian campaign and moved to Sicily. Field Marshal Albert Kesselring has given control of 2,000 first-line aircraft. Kesselring's mission, gain control of air and sea between South Italy and North Africa. In other words, Blitz Malta. In command of a group of 40 Luftwaffe bombers is 27-year-old Captain Robert Kovalevsky. The group which I command consists of 40 bombers with a crew of four men each. These crews are all professional soldiers. From our missions over Norway, France and England, we have become welded together in strong unity. The cooperation and spirit among us is very high. I am very proud to lead them. The real purpose behind our aerial attacks is to prepare Malta for invasion by our paratroops. Therefore, the destruction of the three aerodromes and all harbor installations is essential. Once this is accomplished, our invasion will have no difficulty in succeeding. From an altitude of 3,000 meters, we commence our bombing run. The British have fortified Malta with excellent anti-aircraft batteries. Not as many as we experienced over London, but their accuracy is deadly. No matter how often we bomb the airfields, the British always seem able to keep one in operation. Their ability to repair the runways with such speed is astounding to us. The biggest holes and bomb craters are filled within 24 hours. We have to admire their perseverance, but how long can they hope to keep it up? fire is controlled by the gunnery director, but in these hot situations he often gets so busy ranging other guns that my crew goes into local control, firing at the first jerry that crosses our sights. The enemy planes come and go so quickly we are forever switching targets. With everyone hopping about it is impossible to determine if our crew has scored any hits. It doesn't really matter so long as the final tally is big. December, Malta has withstood 1,000 Axis raids, and still the tempo of the air raids mounts steadily. Malta, only 15 miles long, becomes the most heavily bombed target in the world. The equivalent of a blitz on Coventry is repeated every 18 hours, for a month. Normally, we fly just two attacks in one day. However, when the moon is full, we are alerted to bomb around the clock. Then, we fly as many as six missions. This puts a great strain on everyone. Soon, your head is buzzing from the engine noise. Your ears feel they will burst. Your eyes cannot stand the intense light. Your mouth is a burning desert, your heart wants to stop beating, and your mind barely remembers the details of flying. 
In war you cannot help but think of the odds of surviving. They are decidedly against you. This realization brings you face to face with your Schweinehund, the inner cowardice which everyone has in the face of danger. The possibility of a forced landing at sea is always on our minds. I recently lost one of my best crews. I watched the sea swallow them without pity. April 17th, embattled Malta wins a decoration for bravery. King George VI awards the island the Order of the George Course marking the first time the medal is given to a people rather than an individual. The award ceremony is cut short by the arrival of uninvited guests. The George Cross is quite a boost to the civilian population, though it doesn't mean much to us, the service personnel. But the people apparently think quite a lot of it, and I'm glad to see them receive it. have so few fighter aircraft left that our guns have really become our first and only line of defense. From a point of view of aerial warfare, this is quite ridiculous. And unless we get more fighters in to remedy the situation, we can't last. There are now only eight British aircraft operating against some 15 Axis squadrons. Walter's needs, says the air officer commanding, is Spitfires, Spitfires, and more Spitfires. There is not a single British aircraft carrier available for the dangerous but urgent mission to Malta. The Prime Minister appeals to the President of the United States. The response is immediate. The American carrier Wasp brings British Spitfires into the Mediterranean. April 29th. The desperately needed Spitfires arrive on Malta, but not for long. German radar has alerted the Axis air fleet at Sicily. Before the Spits can refuel, the Luftwaffe strikes. Every Spitfire is destroyed or disabled. On the same day, the British intelligence learns that an airborne invasion from Sicily is imminent. German and Italian paratroops on Sicily trained vigorously for the airborne invasion of Malta. Hitler and Mussolini fixed the date of the Axis assault for early June. April 30th, 1942. Malta has been under steady aerial siege for 23 months. The British no longer have aeroplanes and pitifully little ammunition left for the anti-aircraft batteries. But the island's excellent shelters have kept human casualties incredibly low. I went along with the civilians into a shelter, quite a good one, deep underground. I found it overflowing with people, some of them huddled together and crying. Most of them have been living in here for months. Never before this have I had such a sense of mass humanity so utterly helpless. When the all clear sounds, I come back into the light and I say to myself, 
this is the last time I ever go into one of those shelters, no matter how many Jerry's come. May 9th, 1942. The wasp stings a second time. The American aircraft carrier successfully delivers a second batch of Spitfires to within flying range of Malta. are refueled and airborne in minutes as German bombers approach for a quick kill. They meet the Yonkers and Measure Schmidt head on over the airfield. The Luftwaffe gets more than it bargains for. 37 German planes lost as against three Spitfires. Next day, the British meet with even greater success. Though still outnumbered, the Spitfires possess greater speed, firepower, and maneuverability. Bitter and continuous air fighting, they shoot down 60 German planes. The blitz is over. British intelligence learns that Axis troops scheduled to invade Malta have been diverted to the Panzer Army in Africa. The invasion of Malta will not take place. Saved from one ordeal, the beleaguered island now undergoes another. Malta continues to be dependent on the outside world for such things as grain, meat, and gasoline. The Germans commence starvation tactics. British convoys attempt to reach the island from both Gibraltar and Alexandria. 115 Allied vessels, only two get through. Rationing takes its toll. Morale sinks. Fuel is low. Community kitchens barely feed 100,000. The British set a target date for surrender. Beyond that date, there will be no food. A message from Walter reads, the very worst must happen if we cannot replenish vital needs. At the end of July, the secret target date for surrender draws near. Oil is all but gone. The fate of Malta hangs on receiving supplies by mid-August. Churchill's message, hold and we win. pedestal, a convoy carrying the last hope for the relief of Malta leaves England. Fourteen merchant ships carrying over 120,000 tons of supplies are escorted by four aircraft carriers, 40 destroyers, two battleships, and 12 cruisers. The reinforced convoy is too big to conceal from the Germans. August 10th, the strongest fleet ever to sail to Malta enters the Mediterranean. Converging against it, a powerful German-Italian force, spearheaded by 21 submarines and 540 aircraft.
Texas air attack is in full force. British carrier planes and concentrated ACAX fire again keep the attackers well away from the merchantmen. But finally, 40 Stuka bombers drive right through the barrage. By 8 o'clock, fleet and convoy reach the Narrows, where protective battleships and carriers must turn back because of restricted sea room. The merchantmen must now squeeze through the channel with only a skeleton escort. Crippled merchantmen make port at Malta. They bring food, but no petrol. The tanker Ohio, an American ship with an all-British crew, carries that petrol. Malta's sole hope for survival. With its back broken and its main deck freely washed by the sea, the slowly sinking tanker staggers into harbor with its precious cargo. Malta has survived its darkest hour. Robert Kovalevsky, after the Malta operations, participates in attacks on convoys from Western France. As the war ends, he is a lieutenant colonel in command of a squadron of Arado jet bombers. He spends two years as a prisoner of war. Douglas Adcock is aboard HMS Penelope when a ship is sunk by a mine in the Anzio campaign. He later fights in Pacific operations against Japan. He separates from the Royal Marines two years after the war's end. The island of Malta proved to be the most important factor for British victory in Africa, hastening defeat for the Desert Fox and making the Mediterranean a truly British sea. On the bottom of that sea lie more German and Italian soldiers than under desert sand, and more war material than the axes used in the entire African campaign. Four months of slugging it out on the line, our outfit was on its last legs. Nobody cared if we lost the war or not. We just felt Casino was a tomb, and that all of us were going to die there. Throughout World War II, Private Ira Hunt was an infantryman with the 36th Division, the Texas Division. Today he lives in Inglewood, California, and manages a string of theaters in the western states. Early in 1944, Major Rudolf Bermler served as commander of a special combat team charged with the defense of Monte Cassino in Italy. Today he lives in Tübingen, Germany, 
and is the editor of four military magazines and newspapers. Those days and nights on Monte Cassino taught me much. Only fairness on both sides made it possible for some of us to live through it. But still the question is with me. Will people ever learn to settle their differences without war? In the titanic struggle for Monte Cassino, the lives of Ira Hunt and Rudolf Bermler came together for a brief moment. Two fighting men, one American, one German, relived that moment in history. September 3rd, 1943. The Allies complete their conquest of Sicily, then move quickly to invade Italy itself. Two divisions of the British 8th Army cross to the toe of the Italian boot to encounter only minor German delaying tactics. That same day, the Italian government surrenders. On September 9th, the 5th Army, composed of three American and three British divisions, launches an amphibious assault on the west coast of Italy at Salerno Bay, 30 miles south of Naples. One of the American soldiers at Salerno was a rifleman from Missouri, Private Ira Hunt. I was with the 45th Division when we landed in Sicily last June. Now I'm with the Texas Division, the 36th. I don't care what the comic books and movies tell you, this is no adventure or thrilling experience, and I wish I wasn't stuck with it. We're moving through an olive grove and running into more and more small arms fire. The engineers are trying to clear a path through a minefield, but artillery shells bursting in the trees are causing plenty of casualties. There's only one more thing that can go wrong, and it does. I get hit in the leg. The medics take me back down the hill as more guys come up to get whatever's in store for them. For nearly a week, the Allies are threatened with another Dunkirk. Then, with the help of powerful airstrikes and the big guns of the British Navy, they break out of the German ring. October 1st. The 5th Army marches into Naples, a city of 750,000 people. But more important, a great port for the landing of men and supplies, once it is cleared of the destruction left behind by the Germans. The general feeling is the Allies will be in Rome within two months. Every German unit in Italy is alerted, ready to move quickly to counteract any Allied breakthrough. In one of the units held in reserve is Major Rudolf Bermler of the 1st Parachute Infantry Division. Our division has been resting near Avena for the past months. Now that the Allies are renewing their offensive, we are ordered to move south again. The exact place is kept secret, but already I have orders to increase the strength of my battalion. This means only one thing. The High Command is expecting heavy casualties. The Germans, led by Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, are out to bleed the Allies. They risk only small forces. From their hilltop positions, they methodically direct an avalanche of steel on the attackers. When their own positions are seriously threatened, they withdraw a mile or two and repeat the process. The defenders are always hidden protected by the terrain. The attackers must continuously expose themselves. Like a punch-drunk fighter, the Allied force staggers blindly forward to be hit again and again. I've been 
been returned to duty with the 36th, but now I am assigned as a signal man setting up communications between regiment and battalion headquarters. The Army classifies the job as non-combatant and arms me with a carbine instead of a rifle. They're not kidding me, though. I'm in the same boat with the infantry. October drags by with the Allies meeting progressively stiffer resistance. While German rearguard troops are conducting the well-planned fighting withdrawal, behind them, engineers and labor battalions are perfecting a strong defense barrier, the Gustav Line. The only thing favoring the Allies is their superior air power. But in mid-November, cold rain and even snow begin to fall. Now the Air Force is of little help. And on the ground, American armor bogs down in the mud. Still short of the Gustav Line, the Allies halt for a rest and regrouping. Two months to Rome is a hollow joke now. The Eternal City is still 90 miles away. Napoleon once said, poverty, hardship, and misery are the school of the good soldier. The men in the lines are good soldiers, but they don't appreciate this kind of schooling. The keystone of the Gustav Line is Monte Cassino. An 1,100-foot peak, it overlooks the entrance to the best approach to Rome, the Liri Valley, through which runs the Via Casilina. The Germans have dug emplacements in the sides of the mountain, placed large guns inside natural and man-made caves. They concentrate their highly mobile mortar batteries behind the peak in deep ravines and locate well-protected machine gun nests all over the mountain. Everywhere else, the slopes are covered with a terrible tangle of barbed wire and thousands of anti-personnel mines. And to complicate matters more for the Allies, there's a historic monastery perched on top of the mountain. It is here on Monte Cassino that St. Benedict founded the Benedictine Order in the 6th century. Should the Allies destroy the site in the course of their assault, they may outrage a large part of the Christian world. December 1st, no more respite. Again, the 5th Army lunges forward into the middle of the line. Its objective, a group of hills which stand before Monte Cassino. The key height, Monte Camino. 925 big guns direct fire on this one objective. in Poland and Russia and participated in the Aryan invasion of Crete, which was an extremely bloody undertaking. But the fighting now going on here is the severest ordeal. As expected, our casualties are quite heavy. It may take the Allies 1,000 rounds to get one man, but they seem determined to do it. We don't know what the maps call the hill ahead of us, but we call it Million Dollar Mountain. Some GI figured out that in the past 12 hours, Uncle Sam has shot a million bucks into that hill. dollar hill taken, the G.I.s find the more open country beyond, with its lesser but more heavily fortified hills even harder to take. It's not until January 15th that the last of these hills falls. One mile away is the Rapido River, and right behind that, Monte Cassino. The 5th Army, using eight divisions, has taken six weeks to advance eight miles, suffering nearly 16,000 casualties. But there's no stopping now. A live strategy calls for a flanking attack from the sea, a landing at Anzio, 30 miles to the north. An immediate offensive must be launched against the Gustav Line to draw German reinforcements away from the Anzio area. The 36th Division is to spearhead the drive.
The situation right now is a real morale breaker. We're down to one-third strength. We've been on the line continuously ever since leaving Naples. And now orders came for us to break across the Rapido. Undermanned, under strength, against an opponent that is over strength Lord knows how many times. Sitting up there on that mountain, watching every move we make. January 20th, 1944. The Allies make a concerted attack on the Gustav line 60 miles south of Rome. The purpose to breach the line if possible, but mostly to contain German troops around the casino sector while other American and British soldiers make a landing at Anzio. The toughest assignment falls to the 36th Division. The 143rd Regiment moved out before dawn. And our regiment, the 141st, is backing them up for the crossing. The first try fails miserably. We're not stopping. Keep pushing to get across. That's the order. If the Germans drive you back, regroup and hit again. Each man is his individual command. His duty is to get across the river, not as a company, not as a platoon, but as an individual till more guys get across. The Germans are about 80 yards away from us. And we figure that being so close, there's no chance for their artillery to fire on us. But they get their signals mixed up. And their own artillery clobbers them and us at the same time. German artillery has prevented the building of a pontoon bridge across the river. All boats, footbridges, and telephone wires are destroyed. The men isolated on the German side of the river run out of ammunition. They try to return. Only the strong swimmers make it. 1,681 men of the Texas Division are lost. On the plus side, the Allied assault on Casino does succeed in bringing more German reinforcements to the Gustav line. Troops that otherwise might have been used to repulse the Anzio landing. Still bogged down, the Allies plan a second attack on Monte Casino, to be spearheaded mostly by fresh New Zealand and Indian troops. But the question of the monastery on top of the mountain still plagues the Allies. There are days of agonizing indecision over whether the abbey should be bombed and shelled. Even if the abbey isn't being presently used, its 10-foot thick walls will give the Germans a second line of defense if they're driven from the mountainside. So the monastery will eventually have to be destroyed anyway. This argument prevails. On February 14th, leaflets are dropped to the abbot, five monks and 200 refugees living in the monastery, warning that the site will be bombed. No date is given. The 80-year-old abbot asks the Germans to provide an escort to safety. He is assured they will have an escort within two days. February 15th. The brothers and refugees are still in the monastery when an ominous sound turns a light in German eyes to the sky. ways I hated to see the Abbey bombed but then you ask yourself what's better destroy a building or get a lot of guys knocked off trying to take it I'm only sorry the brass held off so long before doing it 
Even the Italian peasants around here knew it would have to go. Allied ground forces have not been notified of the timing of the air assault. Unprepared, the British Dominion troops launch a half-strength attack. At a terrible cost in lives, they advance on the north to within 1,000 yards of Monte Cassino and to the railroad station on the south end of the town, Cassino. But they can advance no farther. The second attack on Monte Cassino ends in a deadlock. The heavy bombing and shelling by the Allies have reduced the entire Abbey of Monte Cassino into rubble. I decide to set up my command post within the ruins for better protection. March 15th, the Germans still hold the town of Cassino at the foot of the mountain. 500 Allied planes hit the town with 1,400 tons of bombs. Enemy bombers bombed the town of Casino below us. So many bombs are dropped, the whole mountain shakes like a dying animal. All of us feel quite helpless, more so because we can do nothing to help our comrades trapped in the town. In the wake of the bombing, a three-pronged drive is launched against a stunned enemy. Most of Casino falls. Gurkha troops clamber halfway up Monte Cassino itself to occupy a spur of the mountain called Hangman's Hill. This could spell victory, but unaccountably, a reserve battalion fails to receive orders to join the assault. The initial momentum is lost. The vaunted 1st Paratroop Division also make a difference. They swarm down the mountain slopes to counterattack Allied strong points. It is ironic how in this holy place, life has become a hell beyond description. All this fighting and dying has altered our military habits. Officers and men from the lower ranks have grown closer together. So much do we depend on each other. I know I can count on the soldier next to me. And he knows too I will not fail him. On March 23rd, the third offensive against Monte Cassino was called off. During the following weeks, there are no major actions as winter runs its course. The Allied commander in Italy, British General Sir Harold Alexander, bolsters his forces opposite the Gustav Line. The Germans think he has six divisions. He has 13. Some replacements came up this morning. Green rookies straight from the States. They sure look scared, and I'm wondering, who'll be the first one to break? I know I broke several times under fire. In this situation, you have everything in the world going against you, and nothing for you. May 11th, the final assault begins. On the left flank between the sea and the mountains, the U.S. Second Corps applies pressure but is stopped. To its right, moving over the roadless Arunzi Mountains, the French Corps catches the enemy by surprise, threatens to flank the Leary Valley defenses. In the center, the 13th British Corps crosses the Rapido below Casino. And to the north, the Polish Corps swings behind Monte Cassino.
suffering a shortage of food for 10 days now. But most bothersome is our thirst. The wells are either destroyed or clogged with dead. The French and Poles have cut deep into our lines. The whole front is threatened. Marshal Kessering has ordered us to abandon Monte Cassino. For us paratroopers, it is a severe blow. After so many sacrifices in defending this point, we must give it up without a fight. We ask ourselves, was all the suffering and dying worth it? Yes, it kept the Allied bombers away from our homeland that much longer. The Polish and British troops closed their pincers behind Monte Cassino on May 18th. But the German garrison escapes, slipping out just before the gap is closed. It is the Polish Corps which finally takes possession of Monte Cassino. The only Germans they find are the wounded left behind to surrender. The Germans retreat to a secondary defense position six miles behind the Gustav line, the Adolf Hitler line. But the Allied push is at last relentless, enabling American 5th Army troops at Anzio to break out. The Germans go into headlong retreat. June 4th, the American 5th Army marches into Rome. Two days later, D-Day, other armies of the Allies land in Normandy. The Battle of Cassino to the world at large becomes merely a page in history. Ira Hunt later takes part in the invasion of southern France, which he calls a picnic compared to the Italian campaign. He is one of that minority of original 36th Division soldiers who last out the war in Europe, in his case with two Purple Hearts. After escaping from Cassino, Rudolf Bermler is promoted to colonel and placed in command of a regiment in northern Italy. Following Germany's surrender, he becomes first a prisoner of the Americans, then the British and is released in 1948. The Battle of Casino is remembered by many for its destruction of a historic place of worship, by others for what they call the needless sacrifice of men across the rapido. However Monte Casino was remembered, it was another example of the waste and futility of war. <laughs> 